Hi, I'm very excited to be here with all of you for this first episode of our podcast. And well, we're going to, going to be talking about so many things. Um, and basically the message is why we will make it, you know, when it comes to the global warming crisis and the biodiversity loss crisis and everything that we're going through as humanity, um, uh, we are very anxious, eco-anxious. We are very worried. There is a lot of, you know, concern and worry about what the future holds, if there is a future. And there's, of course, an amplification of fear from the media in terms of how um, awful it, everything is. And I don't want to minimize it. Of course not. And we know this is a true crisis and there's something we need to do. When you approach this from a psychological perspective, we know that when people are frozen and in panic, there's not much we can do either. So it's very important that we approach this from a, from a proactive perspective. And that's what we want to do. We want to be sure that everyone first understands what the problem is that we're facing, because there's also a lot of misinformation in the spectrum from people thinking climate change is a hoax and it doesn't really exist to people thinking maybe it's awful and we're all going to die in a month. It's not really any of those cases. <laughs> well, certainly this is not a hoax, but we're also not all dying in a month. A lot of people have already suffered and have been victims already. People, and animals and ecosystems, they are the victims of the global warming crisis and that has happened and we need to honor that and we need to acknowledge that in order that, you know, that for us to to find solutions and to stop it so that there's no more suffering. But we also need to start, you know, breaking the problem down in ways that we can understand the urgency of certain things, the things that we can do, the things that we cannot do or cannot control and how we can maybe be part of something that that collectively can affect change there. But really understanding the crisis, number one, um, to the root of the problem. And number two, also understanding how we feel in the face of this crisis, what it's asking us to do or to change or to relearn or unlearn or reimagine. And that's a huge one as well. Uh, we also need to understand what the enemies of progress are to finally understand the importance of the work that we need to do. Uh, we're going to be bringing top experts from different industries, from different areas and sectors as well, to talk about the psychological aspect of these, uh, to talk about the science of these, to talk about our behavior as well, what we can do, what we cannot do, what we shouldn't do, and so on and so forth. But for this first episode, we thought it would be very important to set things straight. So again, there is a lot of misinformation. We know that. Some people also think, you know, when they hear a lot of voices that are on social media, there are a lot of influence, influencers talking about sustainability and they're doing a great job. I'm not criticizing anyone, um, but there's so much confusion, right? And some people say, okay, maybe if I separate waste, then uh, I'll be doing my part. And some other people might think, okay, if I stop using a plastic straw, I'm doing my part. And some other people might be thinking, no, no, you know what? This is not my problem. I'm an individual. I cannot deal with this. Uh, this should be the government's problem. Or some other people might think, okay, this is not about me recycling. This is about, you know, corporate, the corporate world solving this problem that they uh, started, actually. Or maybe it's all about the fossil fuel industry. And yes, that's right. This is something that involves all of us. But at the end of the day, we are here. We live in this planet as well. We share our home and we all have a role. We can choose what role we want to play and we can choose how to approach this crisis. We can paralyze, we can be super angry, or we can find a way through all these emotions to find out what we can do, the, the things that we are able to do to change to affect change. So that's really what we want to do in this space. And that's why um, I'll begin with really dissecting the problem. Because of this misinformation, everyone needs to be on the same page. It would be very hard to have everyone on board. Imagine this was a ship and having everyone on board, but having all the crew thinking we're, re we're going, you know, this or that way, different ways, the 
everyone thinking the best way to get there is this or that and not being aligned. That would be crazy. So first of all, we all need to understand the problem. And so I'm going to walk you through what we have built um, at, at Alter Leap. And that's like a pyramid. It's an infographic and you can download it. Um, you can find all the links underneath uh, when, when you Wherever you click to listen or watch this uh, this episode, you're going to find a link there where you can download that infographic. And this infographic, I'm going to walk you through it, but it's basically an explanation of the problem and how to understand it in a way that really clarifies a lot of things for all of us. So the first thing is understanding that we are in a global warming crisis, that we are at the same time in the face of a biodiversity loss crisis. So these are two things. They're not the same, they're separate. Uh, when one gets worse, it affects the other and accelerates uh, its progress as well. So they're interconnected. But it's important to understand both. What we want, you know, if, if you think about a pyramid, at the top of the pyramid is a bioeconomy or a regenerative economy, or some even call it a green economy. So it's an economy that serves life. You know, bio from the Latin means life. So it's an economy that serves life. It doesn't serve profit only. It doesn't serve people only. It doesn't serve ecosystems only. It serves everything. It serves people, planet, and progress. And when I say progress, it's because we choose to talk about progress instead of profit. As humanity, we can, you, you, we can dream bigger than only profit, right? So it's progress. What do we want profit for at the end of the day? That's the question. So yeah, for everyone to have better lives, to avoid suffering, to avoid hunger, to avoid poverty, to avoid, you know, dictatorships or whatever, you know, there's so many things going on. So when we talk about a bioeconomy, it's an economy that serves life, that the way in which it gives to some doesn't mean it's taking from others, be it nature, ecosystems or people. So that's the aim. In order to reach that, we need to solve the two problems that I was just mentioning. So the global warming crisis is a crisis that's the result of us generating over 55 billion tons of greenhouse gases every year. So that's a lot of greenhouse gases, and they come from different industries. The five main industries that they come from is transportation, energy. So how, how do you produce energy and electricity, how we, how we power life, right? Transportation, how we transport ourselves, how we transport goods and services as well. We also have um, uh, manufacturing, how we build things and stuff, basically, how we nourish ourselves. So how do we produce food? How do we get, you know, the nourishment that we need and the nutrition that we need? And, and those are basically, so energy, transportation, manufacturing, building, and agriculture. So building is all about, you know, how we build houses, but bridges, but highways and everything. These are highly, highly um, greenhouse gases emitters. For instance, to build, I don't know, a building, you need steel and cement and steel and cement emit a lot of greenhouse gases. So we need to find ways in which we can do that without those emissions, right? When we uh, think about the agricultural sector, uh, deforestation. So, for instance, for us to have a lot of cattle, if we if we want to produce meat, we need to cut trees for them to have that space. And then we also use other other pieces of land to produce the food that these cattle need to eat. And so we are accelerating deforestation all over the world. And this has a double effect: deforestation means that we're cutting trees that normally will absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and help us, you know, cool our planet. And if we cut those trees, we're, you know, impeding that. But also, if we have a lot of cattle everywhere, that deforestation is also producing soil um, erosion, 
but also it's producing the the cattle is producing a lot of methane and we know that that's also a very very damaging greenhouse gas so it's contributing to global warming the same goes for everything the way we build things clothes or electronics or stuff that's also super super um, emitting transportation as well flights you've heard probably everywhere people are very concerned about flying a lot or flying all together because uh, because of the emissions so at the end of the day, the picture is showing that we are emitting over 55 billion tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere every day. In order for us to solve this crisis, to avoid going over 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is what was agreed on the Paris Agreement a couple of years ago, and and to keep temperature at a livable, you know, know, standard, we need to lower emissions. So by 2030, the goal there is by 2030, we need to halve greenhouse gases emissions. And by 2050, so imagine 2030, so we have seven and a half years to do that. And then by 2050, we need to reach net zero. A lot of people say we should reach real zero, which is not net zero. And there's a difference because net zero is already taking into consideration mitigation and offsets and, you know, reduction of emissions. And real zero is just a world where there's no emission of greenhouse gases, right? But at least we want to reach to net zero to 2050. That's the goal there. And then when we talk about the other side of the crisis is the biodiversity loss crisis. And the biodiversity loss crisis is different. So it's not about us emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. This is more about us living in an economy that's not a bioeconomy, but that's a capitalist economy. And I know a lot of people get really weird when we mention the word capitalism because it's like, oh, what do you want instead? Communism? No, of course not. But we need to be super open-minded if we're going to solve this crisis. We need to be open to, you know, revisit our lives and our economies and the ways we've been doing things so far. And we cannot deny that capitalism has brought a lot of progress in many ways. If we think about the industrial revolutions, the first, the second, the third, and even the the digital uh, revolution as well, of course, there's a lot of progress and we need to re- to remember that because it wouldn't it would be very unfair to think, oh, we've only, you know, screwed the planet and ourselves and there has been no progress whatsoever. There has been progress. There are medications that help people, you know, avoid certain disease or stop suffering or experiencing pain. There are things that have helped us even improve certain or take care of of nature and certain ecosystems as well. There are great things that have happened. We want these great things to continue without damaging, without extraction, without, you know, violating the rights of people or even nature as well. So that's that's the thing. And when we think about and talk about biodiversity loss, it's basically the result of, of that system that's based on extraction and over-exploitation. And it's okay to use the resources that we have in our planet for the benefit of all the, the people and animals and, and ecosystems that inhabit this planet. But we always need to be careful and bear in mind that we don't have a planet with infinite resources, unlimited resources. We have a planet that needs time to regenerate and to replenish as well. And we haven't been respecting that. And so we need to start doing that. We need to start building systems that are not extractive only, but that are, well, that actually that are not extractive. We need to start building systems that are regenerating. So I take, but I also give something so that I can keep taking, basically. Imagine if you have a small garden with like a vegetable garden, you keep planting, right? Otherwise, you'll get carrots one day, eat them, and that's it. You need to keep planting them so that you can always go back and you know, know that there will be carrots for you to eat in the future and for your children and grandchildren, if you want to have children and grandchildren as well. So the biodiversity loss is all about that. If we want to reach a bioeconomy, we need to stop destroying and extracting. And we need Actually, when we think about the targets for 2030, like we did for for the global warming crisis, when it comes to biodiversity loss, we need to understand first where it's coming from. So it's coming basically from deforestation, of course, pollution, 
plastic and chemical pollution, basically, but also overexploitation of natural resources, how we are overexploiting. So if you think about like deep sea trawling, you know, these massive ships that are on the oceans and they're just sending these huge, like really enormous nets to the bottom of the sea and, and taking whatever they find, that's really bad because that's overexploitation and it's really unnecessary. And there are so many other examples. So overexploitation is the third one. We have deforestation, pollution, overexploitation, urban growth, especially when it when it's not planned with a bioeconomy in mind. So we need to grow because People are being born every day and, and there's overpopulation, but the point is there are more people coming, no? So we know that we'll be 10 billion in a couple of years. We're 7 billion right now. So urban growth is very important when it comes to biodiversity loss. If we do it without planning, if we do it without really thinking things through, we're going to be destroying ecosystems that could have been considered and saved simply because we didn't plan about it. So we need to start doing that differently. But urban growth is the fourth one. And finally, anthropocentric planning. And this this sounds like a weird word, but anthropocentric means it's based on and centered and focused on humans. So we need to start thinking about the other ecosystem, uh, ecosystems and the other, you know, the ecosystems and, and the animals that, that share this planet with us. It's not only about humans it's about everyone and it's not because you know a lot of people still think yeah but humans were the most intelligent being blah 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 whatever the point is if they are not doing well if animals and plants and ecosystems are not doing well we're not going to do well either so we need to understand there's that interconnection and interdependency as well and that's why it's important to to change that anthropocentric planning and start doing a stakeholder planning or a eco-centric planning, if you, if you will. And then what do we want to reach by 2030 when it comes to biodiversity loss? Well, by 2030, we need to halt destruction and biodiversity loss. That means we have seven and a half years to stop destruction and extraction like we have been doing, right? And then by 2050, we need to achieve full recovery of our resilient um, biosphere, which means that we need to start we need to start rewilding and regenerating earth and land and oceans at a very, very, very fast um, pace, very soon. And a lot of people are already doing that, but we need to focus on regeneration. Whereas when we talk about the climate crisis, we need to stop to, to stop um, emitting greenhouse gases and we need to start lowering those emissions until we reach net zero. So that's really the problem that we're faced with. Our planet is warming and we're losing biodiversity. And if we lose biodiversity, we are in big trouble. It's not only about the temperature, it's about all the organisms and living organisms that make life actually good in the planet, whether the temperature is perfect or not. So for instance, if you think about wetlands and mangroves, um, those are important. And we have been losing them at at a very you know, worrying speed because of urban planning, for instance. So there's a lot of interconnections as well. So there is a beautiful beach and there are a lot of mangroves at the beginning of that beach. And then someone has this amazing idea of, oh, let's build a tourist spot here because it would bring us so much money. And then we have to start building a lot of buildings. And that's, you know, a lot of greenhouse gas um, emissions because you're building things with cement, with steel, and we know those are super emitters, right? And then, okay, we want nice beaches, so let's get rid of the mangroves or the of the or the kelp forests or whatever is you know impeding tourists to go into a pristine, super nice beach. And then uh, because of that, certain animals will not be coming anymore and then others will die. And then the insect that was maybe feeding on the, I don't know, the poo of that specific bird that doesn't come anymore because the mangroves are gone is also dying. And then there's there's like so many micro collapses in the ecosystems that happen sometimes invisi- in an invisible way, but that are very important to take into consideration. And the good news is we already have all the knowledge, all the science, all the technology as well, and the innovation to take them into consideration. So that's why it's so important to start planning with nature in mind, not only people and profit. That's what we need to do. If we halt 
destruction and start regenerating. And if we lower emissions and get to net zero, at least net zero by 2050, then we're going to reach eventually and hopefully a bioeconomy. And that's the aim. Why is it important? A lot of people say, well, but then the future of humanity is, in, is at risk and then our great grandchildren will have a horrible life and then maybe there will be no further generations. And to be honest, that's just like the cherry on the cake. The thing is, human potential is amazing. Just look back all the things that we have been able to do. We put a man on the moon for crying out loud, you know, like who would have thought that we could do that? There's so much potential. And yes, we are like any tool or like any actor full of potential for, for good and positive, but also for bad and negative. Yes, we also have been, you know, doing some wars and destroying and, and hurting people and and horrible things. But we have also done so amazing things, such amazing progress of the human mind, of the human spirit. We have, you have, we have risen to the occasion where there has been tragedy. We have been able to work in, you know, with, in solidarity with others, in sisterhood and, and brotherhood with others. We have really made amazing things. Just look back from a positive perspective and see how long and how far humanity has come to. And now think about something. If we manage to solve this crisis and we have everything to make it happen, bear that in mind, we have everything to make that happen. And we have some of the brightest minds right this second working on solutions to make that happen as well. But if we do, it's not only about your children and your grandchildren. Imagine the potential, imagine what, where we would be, what we would be doing in 200, in 500 years. Imagine that, how we could be in, you know, in unison with nature as well and, and finding so many greater ways to live our human life, but also our collective life in the planet. It's really mind blowing. And I think, and we believe that we should be focusing more on that as well, imagining those futures as well imagining those possibilities and then in a sort of reverse engineering exercise coming back and saying okay that's what we want that's how it looks in so many years in terms of education entertainment transport uh, food manufacturing everything how, what do we need to do to make it happen if we start today what do we need to change and that's something that could be very motivating and we need motivators at this moment in, in time, in life. Um, but also understanding that we need to open our minds, like I was saying, to relearn and rethink and reimagine things. And so once you understand the problem, and I hope it's clear where the problem is coming from, we need to understand the actors that are needed to, to affect change. So yes, there are governments, there's the corporate sector, the private sector, there's the media, and there's citizenship. So you might be a citizen, you might be a CEO or the owner of a company, you might be a government official, or you might be someone working or even owning a media outlet. So we all have a role to play there. And we just need to find out what our role there is. Where can we really affect change? Where can we really have more or less control when it comes to changing or improving things, right? So that's that's another thing that we need to start doing. There's another level as well that has to do with um, the tools that we have to make this happen. We have frameworks, we have innovation, we have technology. We also have the capacity to do planning, to do teamwork. We have means of production that we need to start changing as well. So it's also about how can we, if we want to build a bioeconomy, what can we do to start producing things in a different way from a bioeconomy perspective, living from a bioeconomy perspective, producing things from a bioeconomy perspective as well. And then another one that's very, very important. I just want to make a very quick recap before going into that one is we know now that the problem 
then the root of the problem is global warming crisis, biodiversity loss crisis, what we need to do to get there to, by 2030 and then 2050, having biodiversity loss and then regenerating the whole biosphere. And then uh, when it comes to global warming crisis, having emissions by 2030 and then getting to net zero by 2050, we know there are different actors and we know that we can do things differently if we put our planet at the center, if we are more planet centric instead of only people centric. Uh, so the means of production, the way we t make decisions, the way the way we plan, and, and the way we produce things need to consider the bioeconomy and need to have the planet at the center as an equal stakeholder on this race. So that's number one. And then you can say, oh, okay, it's not so complicated. I understand the problem. I know it's still very dramatic what's going on, but at least I know where it's coming from. And now I can also place my choices and my lifestyle in that context. So maybe after knowing this, you know that not using a plastic straw doesn't necessarily contribute towards the global warming crisis, but it certainly contributes to lowering pollution when it comes to one of the biggest offenders of biodiversity loss, right? So you can start placing your choices and lifestyle in the context of this problem and, and the, the picture of this problem and the deep understanding of it and, and making better decisions. So that's one. And the second one, and this is really something that might be very uncomfortable to a lot of people, but the second one has to do with your mindset, understanding your mindset and the emotional world. This one is all about the practical, the tactical, the technological, the innovation, the hands-on world. What about the emotional world? It doesn't matter how you were brought up. You have emotions. You have feelings. You are a mammal. You're a human being. And we all have emotions. So we need to acknowledge how we feel about this, how it makes us feel. I'm afraid. I'm anxious. I'm worried. You know, I'm very angry. How did they let this happen? Whatever feelings. But we need to acknowledge them. And we need to also understand what we need to do to change this at a personal level. It's not pointing fingers at others, but what do I need to do? What, what do I need to do differently so that I can be part of the solution? Is it maybe that I need to be more open-minded? We need to understand that what the crisis is asking of us is very um, aggressive because we have been raised with certain ideas. We have been, you know, raised in societies that have certain standards and protocols of what a good family, a good life, a good whatever lifestyle should be. And that includes many things that are hurting our planet. The way we choose to dress ourselves or buy fashion, the way we eat and, and you know, make decisions regarding our food and our family's food, the way we travel, the way we transport ourselves, our services, the way we entertain ourselves, the way we build things, like we were saying. And suddenly someone tells you, you have to change that. That's not right. So imagine you're from, I don't know, from Argentina or Ur Uruguay. You know, they raise cattle ever since I, everyone remembers and their economies have been based heavily on, on the meat industry. And now you go to one person there, maybe even his grandfather had a cattle ranch and you tell them, you have to stop eating meat because otherwise, you know, the world is collapsing. I understand both persons. Of course, we know that's a problem, but imagine at an emotional level, how that person is feeling and how that person is receiving this information. So we need to be first open to understand that this is difficult for a lot of people, for all of us, for you included, actually. There, I'm sure there are certain things that you're very used to doing that now you have, you are being asked to stop doing or do differently and you're feeling uncomfortable. Whether it's a longer shower or a shorter shower or eating meat or not or flying or not flying, it's making everyone uncomfortable. It's questioning everyone's way of living since we were little children, it's even thinking about our parents, like, oh, my parents were contributing to this problem because they were feeding me this or that, or they were doing this or, or you know, even promoting a certain lifestyle. So it's, it's very important to be self-compassionate, to be gentle with ourselves and with others, understanding this is no easy fit, you know, 
everyone is going to feel attacked, everyone is going to feel questioned, and everyone is going to feel that their their lifestyle and the way they have been doing things, they have been raising children, they have been raised themselves, has been put into question and it's wrong and they're being accused. So we need to be very compassionate there. And then we need to ask ourselves, okay, how can I overcome this? How can I deal with this and manage these emotions? Maybe you need to go to therapy and that's okay. And I know there is a lot of stigma out there still, sadly, about it. Or maybe we can just follow some blog or some social media page of someone who's giving advice on this. We ourselves work with uh, an expert on eco-anxiety and our next podcast will all be, uh, the next episode of our podcast will all be about um, eco-anxiety from his expert perspective. So if you're interested in that, please, please listen to it. But it's just, how do we deal with these emotions, acknowledging them and, and doing something about it to protect ourselves and to know that we're not going to have perfect progress uh, because perfection doesn't exist at the end of the day, but we we need to keep giving, uh, you know, baby steps and, and progressing, even if it's imperfectly. It's also very important to understand what you need to do to change. Is it you need to open your mindset? Is it maybe you need to start having conversations with people that you normally wouldn't have conversations with? Is it maybe you need to start relearning things? Is it maybe that once or after you react in a negative way saying, no, I would never do that. No, I've done that my whole life. Maybe after you cool down, you could you could ask someone that thinks like that, talk to you and ask questions instead of just saying, no, no, no. Ask questions and say, okay, I'm open. You know, this is super uncomfortable for me. This is really taking me way out of my comfort zone, but I'm here and I want to listen to what you have to say. And maybe that's the first step, but we need to start understanding that what brought us here will not bring us into the future. Actually, what brought us here, if we keep doing business as usual, will preclude us from having a good future or a future at all. So we need to start changing things and change comes from within. So we need to start asking ourselves, how can I be open? How can I take Radical ideas, maybe for my taste, into consideration, listening to others' point of view, listening to completely different points of view than mine, and being open to that. And finally, working on our mindset. Working on our mindset, and again, there's a lot of stigma on that, but understanding what sort of mindset we need to have to overcome this crisis, both at a personal and at a collective level. So... Do I need to be open? Do I need to be, uh, do I need to have a growth mindset? Do I need to develop resiliency so that when something happens, I don't completely collapse? How do I do that? Uh, what if you're feeling, I don't know, imposter syndrome, like, oh, I'm, I'm actually working on something regarding the planet, but I feel like a I have no idea and, and I'm not good enough. And, you know, all those limiting beliefs or self-doubt that we have, we need to overcome that because our planet needs us to be top of the game. We need to be our best versions. I know it sounds cliche. I've said it before, but our planet needs us to really, really, really be strong at a mental level so that we can take the best decisions so that we can help others as well, you know, and, and give a hand to those who need it. Um, and so that we can also deal with our emotions and keep our eyes into the future and the possibilities and keep motivated because we need that. We need that sort of self-leadership. Um, and the mindset is very, very important. So I wanted to talk about this because if you only have one piece of the picture, if you know where the problem is, it can be very overwhelming. You can quickly become a cynic and say, oh, you know what? Global warming, biodiversity loss, this is going nowhere this is this is this is really going into a very bad place there is no solution we're going to all die it's horrible that's it for me or you can just deny it right like oh no that's that's crazy we will be fine and these are all reactions that come out of a place of fear and insecurity and and being really shocked to death basically um so that's why it's important to talk about those both aspects the understanding the problem but then, okay, I understand it. How can I be my best self to actually be a part of the solution and not be a part of the problem or just be, you know, neutral and, and 
collapsed and frozen out of fear and anxiety. So that's why we need to approach both. And on this podcast, and the reason why we wanted to talk about this and to, to, to launch this podcast, knowing there are so many others around the world and very good ones, is because we felt there, there was a lot of, you know, people focusing on either the problem or either the mindset thing and, and the, you know, emotional bit. And we think they both go together. And they are, honestly. Um, because if you have the best mindset, but you don't understand what the problem is, you could be uh, precluding the world from having a much more powerful and impactful you. And again, if you only know about the problem but don't have the mindset, then you might you might struggle a lot along the way. And we want you to have all the energy and all you know the the expertise and the know how and the understanding to really pull through. And we're gonna be here talking with top experts about many things that will help you on your journey as an individual, but also collectively to get there by 2030 to where we need to get, and then eventually to 2050. We are absolutely convinced that, that we have everything we need. The technology, the innovation, the strategy, the science, the experience, the history, the everything, the human power and the human willing. And of course, nature as the greatest teacher there is, and every day we're learning more and more from her and her processes to make this happen. And that's why this podcast exists, to give you a little bit of hope, a little bit of skills and tools and insight, but a little bit of strength as well and understanding based on science, based on facts, based on data, so that you can leave every episode feeling a little bit hopeful, more hopeful, hopefully, but also a little bit more empowered and you know equipped to go out and be part of the solution because never never forget we will make it thank you <laughs>